Hello, I'm going to give the meanings of the planets according to a system of astrology known as vibrational astrology. So I'm going to give the meanings of the Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And these meanings are a little bit different from the usual meanings that you read about and hear about, and if you're a practicing astrologer, that you use in your own practice, most likely, because the usual meanings of the planets in modern Western astrology are archetypal. For example, Saturn is seen as the wise old man. It gives wisdom, detachment, maturity, a sober, no-nonsense attitude. We all can relate to this archetype, to this image. We think of this wise old man, we immediately know a lot of things about him. He's not the kind of person who's going to laugh and joke around a lot, serious, gets to the point. We can relate to this archetypal image. And the idea in a lot of modern Western astrology is that that archetypal image is represented or is embodied in the planet Saturn. Somehow Saturn emanates this archetypal quality. And even in the videos that I've made on introductory astrology, I describe the planets this way. So in the introductory videos on astrology, I describe Saturn as a wise old man. But that's not actually exactly how I do it in my own astrology. Now, what I'm going to describe to you is not completely different. It's a little bit of a different perspective. And one of the differences is this. In vibrational astrology, we see each planet as doing only one thing. Now, at first this sounds a little crazy, like I'm going to explain everything in life by assigning one little tiny function to each planet. It sounds a little bit bizarre, but if you think about it, all of music is generated out of 12 notes, all Western music, out of 12 notes in different octaves. All in basic chemistry, every physical thing is created out of the same things and the number of electrons in the in the rings determines how the chemicals will interact and so on. So it's not unusual in both arts and sciences for complex things to be made out of simple functions. And that's the idea in vibrational astrology. If this idea works, that each planet only does one thing, it makes your astrological interpretation very easy. Because instead of seeing Saturn in the chart and thinking, okay, here's the wise old man, he's wise, he's detached, he's mature. Instead of having this conglomeration of different things, you can go right to a specific thing, target it, and it's, I claim, and I believe that it's more consistently accurate because you get right to the essential function that's behind all these things, and that these other things, like the wisdom, the detachment, the maturity, are symptoms or expressions of the basic function. So, what is the basic function of Saturn? What Saturn does is it removes everything superficial to get to the essence of things. It's like a knife that cuts in and gets rid of everything superficial, everything that's unnecessary, and gets down to the bones, to the structure, to the essence. We associate Saturn with the skeleton, the bones, the, the structure of a building. And that very much is what Saturn's about. It wants to get down to what's really going to last. What will last past your lifetime? So you could think of, for example, Venus Saturn. Well, I'll talk about Venus in a minute. But let's just think about Venus as related to romance and you know falling in love. Let's just do that. That's not exactly what Venus is. But if somebody has a Venus Saturn aspect, then what kind of romance do they want? Saturnian. What does that mean? Frustrated? <laughs> you know, blocks? We often look at Saturn as this great malefic that blocks everything. Actually, what Saturn's trying to do is to get to something that lasts, will last past your life. Something that's, that's, when you're dead and gone, it will still be there. So Saturn's not that impressed by a pretty face. It's more impressed by character by being loyal or being faithful or being sincere. These qualities of the soul that will last past death. The, the, well, you can even think of it this way, metaphysically, if you believe in life after death, like people that see ghosts and so on, 
what would make that connection past death? It would be what your principles are, what you are at, at heart, what really counts. So this is what Saturn's about, trying to strip away down to what's really, really important. And there are things that are really important and that will last. And there are other things that are more superficial and come and go. Now, those more superficial things are not bad. They're not unimportant. They're just not the interest of Saturn. So we look at each planet as having a goal, having a target, having a purpose. So at the heart of reality, and these planets describing fundamental features of reality, our goals, our purposes, our missions, and Saturn has a purpose. And we look at the chart as a dynamic process. That's one of the key issues in vibrational astrology, is that we see the whole chart as a process with a purpose. And each combination of planets are trying to achieve something, trying to, to get somewhere. Uh, so Venus, Saturn, trying to get to that essential beauty, we could say. Okay, well, let me talk about Venus. Well, I'll give you another example. I'm going to cover in this video all ten planets. Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. You know that Sun and Moon aren't planets, but we use those terms in astrology for those ten main objects. Now, what about Venus? What does Venus do? We think of Venus as the planet of love, harmony, beauty. People put different emphasis on it. What I see Venus is as, in, in vibrational astrology, what is Venus doing? It's the way we are attracted to beauty. So there's a fundamental given in life that beauty is attractive. When we see a beautiful landscape, you know, a beautiful garden, our eyes open up. We're drawn to it. We want to go in that garden. We want to walk in the garden. When we see something that's not Venusian, not attractive, we're repelled by it. We move away. Our eyes kind of squint and get smaller. So we open up to beauty. Beauty is like a magnet. And Venus is the power of the magnetism of beauty. I don't know why beauty is attractive. I don't know why we're drawn to it. I don't know how we figure out what's beautiful, but we do. We figure that out. Actually, we do have ideas on what makes things beautiful, if it's symmetrical, if, if they blend together in certain ways. But that's what Venus is. It's the attractive power of beauty. And there is intelligence in Venus. We often think that Venus is purely emotional. But when we see something beautiful, we you might say organically, intuitively sense the symmetry, the balance, the flow of the colors, the intricacy and detail of the patterns. It, it grabs us, it draws us into it. But that symmetry, those patterns, those color connections, there are rules for that. There, there's, you might say, a mathematics behind it. There's forms behind it. But Venus doesn't analyze it intellectually. It's drawn to the beauty of that. So Venus is the way we are attracted to beauty. Now, is Venus related to art? Using this interpretation, is Venus art? It's only art to the extent that the art is beautiful. We know that some art is not designed to be primarily beautiful, to draw us into it, to be attractive. Some art challenges us. It shows us different perspectives. It may, the artist may put different elements together in a way that challenges the way we think, may open doors to perception. A lot of art can be mercurial. It's teaching us how to see, how to think. So art is ruled by Venus or is Venusian to the extent that the art is about drawing us into its beauty. So we can get very clear about this. For example, when we see an artist who is more mercurial or in, not primarily involved in drawing us into the beauty of it, we won't see Venus as strong in the birth chart as we do for the artist who's simply making things that draw us into its beauty. So we focused more clearly on exactly what Venus is doing. And why is Venus related to romance? Because we're attracted to the other person. We want to be near them. There's something beautiful about that person that draws us to the person. And the romance is in our hormones. It's in our consciousness. It's in ourselves as human beings. Companies have 
birth charts. Animals have birth charts. All kinds of things have birth charts that may not have the same kinds of capacity for romance that human beings have. So Venus is always doing the same thing, regardless of whether you do it for a company, for a country, for a person, for a horse, for a cat. It's all, everything has a magnetic draw to beauty. So what the astrology does is it's describing fundamental energy flows, energy flows that have a purpose, a function, and a goal. So this is how we see it with vibrational astrology. And one of the great benefits of this is that your interpretation is clearer, sharper, and I believe more accurate. You just go right to the point. So one of the great values of this is not philosophical. It's practical. The way that we came up with these ideas was practical. By looking at charts, we're finding that the usual rules are not working for everybody as well as we would like. When we adjust the rules to use these kinds of interpretations, it works better, it works more consistently, and very wonderfully, it's much simpler because we don't have a lot of things to choose from. The archetypes are true. They are there. The, the Venus as the young pretty girl, that, that whatever archetypes come to mind, or Saturn as a wise old man, they are true, they are real, they are generated in the consciousness of people. But the planets are doing one function, and those archetypes grow out of those functions. So here I've written it down. Let's review this. Venus is related to romantic love because we are attracted to the romantic partner. It is, it is this part of romantic love, the attraction to the person that makes Venus strongly involved in romantic love. There are other things involved in romantic love besides being attracted to the beauty of the other person, but it's that part of romantic love that Venus is involved with. The changes in our hormones as we engage in feelings of romantic love are in us, they're not in Venus. Venus just does one thing, attracts us to beauty. The archetypal stories are in our psyches, not in the planets. So Venus, all it does is regulate our attraction to beauty. And when that power of Venus, that regulating our attraction to beauty, hits a person, interacts with the consciousness and the field, the energy field of a person, it we react in our human way with our human consciousness, and things like romance happen. So as I said, astrology works for babies, cats, horses, all kinds of things, and not all of these things have the capacity to be romantic. They all have the capacity to be attracted to beauty. It's an inherent function of life. It's a mysterious function built out of the symmetries, the energy combinations, color combinations, sound combinations that we instantly recognize and intuitively are drawn to without having to analyze it in a in a mathematical or engineering way. So to summarize, in vibrational astrology, there's an energy process. And this energy process is actually in a higher dimensional reality. Like in super string theory, there's this idea that there are more than the three dimensions of space and the dimension of time. And that is a fundamental idea in vibrational astrology, that these energy processes happen in a higher dimension. This is important because you'll see the ways that people respond to the energies and it becomes a practical, useful concept. You'll see as we get into doing example charts of people. So there's this energy process in higher dimensions that comes down, affects, and, and activates our psyches. And, and that activates the archetypal stories in our consciousness. And from that comes the behavior and personality. So it's like layers of an onion. What archetypal and Jungian and other forms of modern Western astrology have done is they've peeled behind the layer of the onion, behind the behavior and personality, and found there are these archetypal stories. And we're going to peel that onion one level deeper. And I'm proposing that there's this energy process that that is the astrological variables like the planets create and regulate. That that's their, that's fundamentally what they do. So this is a a relatively new idea for some people. When you hear these new ideas, sometimes there's some skepticism or resistance. You can, you know, just entertain this as a possibility, and I think you'll find it very, very reasonable. Okay, and in this bottom paragraph, to repeat the point, the reason we have this theoretical framework, why do we have this idea in vibrational astrology, 
because when we do our interpretations, we get better results with the clients. We can target in and get what we're looking for also in our controlled research studies. We get positive results using these ideas. So they work. And they work very well. Now, let me go through the 10 planets. As I mentioned, we call sun and moon planets. Now, here's an interesting thing about the sun and moon. If each planet, if the sun and moon do a function, what is their function? And what I've come to with this is that the sun and moon regulate our relationship to time. The sun connects us to the current moment. The sun shines a light that brings consciousness and awareness. Without the sun, we're not in the moment. We're, we're not aware of the flow of time and our connection to this instant of time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the sun is like a flashlight that flashes a beam of light on this time continuum and brings the light of day to us, makes us conscious. We take it for granted. I mean, <laughs> without the sun, we're, we're not placed in time very well. We're just floating around in some amorphous reality. The sun is, a, is like a laser beam, brings us right to this point in, in time. So the sun brings consciousness. It makes a clear and present reality. The, uh, any aspect of a planet aspects the sun. Like if you have sun square Saturn, then the function of that planet becomes a clear and present reality in your daily life. It's not just mental. It's not just emotional. It'll affect your daily behavior. It's very important for vocational guidance. The sun is very important for choosing a career because your career is what you'd spend most of your day or a large part of your days doing is your clear and present reality. It's good if the sun is involved. So sun Saturn means the person wants to be doing things that are of fundamental importance. Is sun Saturn good for marketing for large corporations? Very often not. Very often not good because advertising for large corporations is often about how getting how to get people to buy things to to bring it into their attention and not as much attention given to what's the importance of this in the end what's what value do are we leaving after we're dead and gone that's not the emphasis usually okay maybe in some businesses it is i i there are exceptions to every rule, but you get my point. My point is that if you're in a Jupiterian, Jupiter's about growth is very different from Saturn, which is about getting to the essence of things. So people that have strong Jupiter, which is growth, as we'll see, they are better in advertising. If a planet aspects the sun, it's a clear and present reality. Now, that's what the sun actually does. That's what what does the moon do? The moon is also related to the regulation of time. The moon reflects the past into the present. So the sun makes us here, present, conscious, present reality. Nothing imaginary about it, nothing, you know, intuitive or psychic or, or it's just right here in the light of day. The moon reflects the past into the present. Without the moon, we have no memory. So the moon gives memory, it gives soul, habits, habits happen over, happen over time. Instincts, what does instinct means? mean? It means that you can respond quickly because it's become ingrained over time. Moods, we know that moods develop over time. You know, repeated behaviors will lead to a mood and attitude, connection to ancestry and past lives, as many astrologers say. So everything we say about the moon is correct. And all we're really doing here in vibrational astrology is giving a way of understanding that as a fundamental process, a function and a purpose that the moon serves, which is to reflect the past into the present and give us memory, soul, nostalgia, instincts are all functions of the past being reflected into the present. We can't see the future. We can make the future, but there is not a planet that reflects the future <laughs> into the present. That would be cool. Then we could just look into the future and see what it is. But, you know, philosophically, I think most of us think there's free will and the future's not pre-scripted. So there are things that draw us into the future, but not that tell us about the future. The moon reflects the past into the present 
and the deep past is reflected into the present in our moods, our feelings, our dispositions. Now, here's an interesting thing, and this bothered me for many years, over 10 years in my early studies of astrology, that the sun is 99% of the mass of the solar system. It's the center of the solar system. It's what gives us life. I mean, the little planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, even big ones, you know, Jupiter and Saturn are trivial. They're like little specks. They're nothing. The sun is, is, the sun is where it's at. It's the whole big deal. And yet in astrology, the sun is only one object out there. We don't give 99% of the importance of the astrology chart to the sun. It's kind of disproportionate. I always found that interesting. Uh, the moon, of course, is very close to us. It appears to be the same size as the sun. So why is it that these two extremely important objects, much more important, they dominate in, you know, what the solar system is and what we see in the sky, but they do not dominate 99% of our astrological interpretation. Things like this I think about a lot. It doesn't seem to bother a lot of astrologers, but I, I just think about these things, trying to understand how astrology works. And what I've come to the conclusion is, is that the sun and moon regulate our relationship to time, and we take the present and the past for granted. They're so fundamental. They're so pervasive. They're so ingrained in the fact that we exist at all and that we have any consciousness at all that we take it for granted but really without the sun and moon nothing's happening they are the 99 percent basis for the other planets to do something so it ends up that they do not have an overwhelmingly dominant uh, purpose in the chart to like 99 percent we all agree sun and moon are the most important but not to the point where we hardly ever look at anything else, like we just only interpret sun and moon. No, we don't do that. We know the positions of the other planets are important because they are like the players on the stage that work out the details of what happens and they become critically important. So this you know, resolves this confusion that I had for, you know, over a decade trying to trying to resolve these these issues. Again, it's not an issue that concerns a lot of people, but it concerned me. Okay, so one thing I like about, about vibrational astrology is so many things are pulled together into a consistent model. Okay, let's talk about the other planets, Mercury. Well, you know, Mercury is interesting because Mercury is usually described in an energy process kind of way, unlike the other planets. So Mercury makes mental connections. Mercury makes associations and sees relationships. Mercury compares and notices similarities and differences, and Mercury communicates. So, as I said, the usual interpretation of Mercury is already a kind of process. And there's not that much difference in the usual interpretation of Mercury and the interpretation of Mercury in VA. We're both saying that Mercury makes connections. Mercury's purpose in life is to notice things. Oh, she's the same height as he is. Or, you know, this is a little deeper blue than this other thing is, or this reminds me of this event in history. It makes connections, associations, relationships. That's what Mercury does. It makes connections in our minds. Okay, Venus, I already explained Venus. It's how we're attracted to beauty. And, and, and it's such an ingrained, taken for granted function that we don't even think about it consciously. But it's this fundamental energetic, energetic principle of the universe that we're attracted to beauty, and Venus regulates the process in the birth chart of how we are attracted to beauty. Mars. Now, we're told Mars is the warrior. It gets into fights. It's, it's red hot. The way we see Mars in VA is Mars is this force to achieve things. We wake up in the morning with a feeling we want to accomplish something. Maybe we want to get to work on time. Maybe it's a weekday, and we've got to be at work at 8.30 in the morning. So the, the alarm goes off or whatever happens, and we think, oh, I want to get to work. That drive, that sense that you're going to achieve something, that if you don't get to work on time, you're not reaching an achievement, a goal, making something happen. Mars is this taken-for-granted force where we want to go, we want to achieve, we want to get somewhere. Now, some cultures... Have, are attuned, they attune more to the Mars force than other cultures. Maybe 
a whole culture and also some people don't wake up in the morning with that much that they want to do, that they want to achieve. There's the, just like some people are attracted to beauty more. So different people are channeling more of the process of certain planets than other people. We all know this in astrology. Planets can be stronger in some charts than other charts. So everyone has this desire to succeed and feeling frustrated when you don't succeed. So Mars is not a spark of energy that becomes aggressive. It's not just like this red hot flame that just wants to burst and go somewhere and that you know gives you energy. Mars simply wants to accomplish things. We have this sense in our minds that we can achieve things, that we can get things done, that we can make progress. And Mars is that desire to get it done. So Mars is a warrior, but not for the purpose of fighting, but for the purpose of accomplishing, accomplishing something. And people do fight because they get frustrated and they can't accomplish things or they, for various reasons, people fight. But Mar the desire of Mars is not directly to fight, but to accomplish something. So what we get from Mars is that life is not static. Built into the nature of life, into the nature of reality, is that life is dynamic. We are being propelled forward and we have a sense of achieving something. And this is the force of Mars. So it's not like God created the universe in seven days and there it is and we all just sit there, you know, like Adam and Eve in our garden and we just are happy and smiley. No, there's Mars and Mars is trying to move things to accomplish something, to, to, to make something out of it, to pick that apple and do something interesting. Oh, I'll mix it with cinnamon and I'll make apple pie, <laughs> you know, and, and I'll use my fire to do that. It, oh, I made my apple pie. It came out really well. It's this desire that you want to do that. You want to make something. You want to get somewhere. You want to achieve something. You want to lose those few pounds. You want to pass that test. You want to get to work on time. You want to make that painting whatever it is. It can be a mental thing, an emotional thing, but you want to do it. You want to achieve it. You want to get there. That's the force of Mars. Each planet gives a very fundamental fact of life, something that's trying to happen. Jupiter only wants to do one thing. People say Jupiter is the planet of the higher mind, of travel, of, of law, of wisdom, of all kinds of things. But Jupiter is really just doing one thing. It's making things bigger. When that force of Jupiter enters into our lives, it can manifest in many ways, especially when we see the sign it's in, the house it's in, the planets that it aspects. It starts to form a very specific story. But the planet itself, taken out of context of the sign, house, aspects, and everything else going on, is just a simple force. And Jupiter makes things bigger. A good image for Jupiter is that it blows things up. It's like a balloon. You take a balloon, somebody blows in the balloon, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's what Jupiter does. It blows things up. What happens if you blow the balloon up too much? It pops. And sometimes when people expand too much outside the capacity of what's possible, the balloon pops. And that can be, for example, spending more money, running up a bill, a debt, doing too much. You think bigger is better, bigger is better, bigger is better. And there are other forces in life. Saturn's trying to contain that and make sure the growth is about something fundamental. You know, Venus is trying to bring it to something beautiful. Mercury's making connections. There are other forces going on, but Jupiter just wants to make things bigger. Without Jupiter, there's no growth. Everybody would just sit there at the level they're at. Maybe they would be working hard but they, because of Mars, but they wouldn't be having a sense of making it bigger of reaching out more. Okay, so let's go on to Saturn. I've already talked about Saturn strips away all that is superficial to get to the essence. Saturn strips to the bones and the fundamentals. Saturn dislikes anything superficial and, un and unnecessary. At heart, Saturn really wants to focus on things that last past death, those things of lasting value. Okay, why is Saturn considered so malefic? Because my forecasting, this is Saturn tends to be more malefic by transit in forecasting and progressions than it does in the natal chart. When Saturn transiting or progressed hits something, you know, it aspects something in your natal chart, it starts stripping things away. It takes away your toys. 
it it says, well, well, maybe you don't need, you know, all of that money. <laughs> you know? Maybe you don't need that that second car or that third car. It it, it challenges you to what's really important. What are you really getting done? What are you doing with all that money? So it challenges you to discover what's really important. We don't like that, especially in the modern Western world where I live in America. We're not big fans of Saturn a lot of times. Um, we're thinking about growing, 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 and we see Saturn as malefic. But Saturn's just doing its thing. Okay, Uranus. Uranus puts us in tune with the current instant. So what Uranus has no interest in the past, no interest in the future. It doesn't even care what happened an hour ago. It doesn't even care what happened a half hour ago. It's just in the moment, and energy travels in waves. And what Uranus does is it puts us on the wave of the current instant. So Uranus has this wave-like function. It's like riding a wave. And you'll see this. For example, Venus Uranus leads to rhythm. Moon Uranus results in rhythm, rhythms of music, rhythms of nature. Why rhythm? Because energy happens to travel in waves, and Uranus is so acutely, so narrowly focused on the moment, it feels the wave, it feels the flow, it trusts the flow. And what does Uranus do? It improvises. So Uranus has to trust the wave, the intelligence of the wave, to take it where it wants to take us. We can't be so proud or so humble or afraid to make fools of ourselves that we're not willing to improvise. So Uranus requires of us to not be too humble, not to be too concerned about making fools of ourselves, but just let it go. So Uranus, you'll see in jazz musicians, it will show up as a strong planet because they're improvising in the moment, being in that instant of time. Uranus is not inherently rebellious, but when you're in the moment, you're not following the rules that are out there, and it may or may not fit within the rules. That's what Uranus does. And we're going to see, when you actually apply these ideas in charts, how it pinpoints exactly what's going on. And again, each planet is performing a function. Here's an example. Uh, I gave a lecture in Australia uh, about the meanings of the planets, and I gave this meaning of Uranus, and one of the attendees raised his hands. He said, I have two children, all have Uranus conjunct the fourth house cusp with less than a one degree orb. What does it mean? I thought for a few seconds and I said, it would be like playing ping pong, or maybe depending on what country you're in, it's called table tennis. Or maybe they, you play the drums, you know, you and your, your two teenage uh, children all have Uranus within one degree of the fourth house cusp. And, and all the times are from a, a birth certificate. I mean, that's just an amazing coincidence. So he said, they have a ping pong table in the basement and they play ping pong frequently, and both children play the drums. And one of the children is a boy, one is a girl. They both play the drums. And you have to wonder, is David psychic? Am I psychic? How the heck do I think of ping pong and drums? And these are two major things in their lives. This is how accurate vibrational astrology is. And what I think is it's not that I'm psychic. What it is, I mean, we're all psychic to some extent, but what it is primarily is if you think about what the fourth cusp means, which I'll talk about at some other time, and what Uranus means, and you stick to what the function is and not the symptoms, you go right to it. Being in the moment with that rhythm, that instantaneous, what is a family going to do? I'm just trying to imagine what it could be. Of course, I have 40 years of experience using these ideas, so I have a lot of images and memories of what has happened with people that help and a lot of experience with it and you come up with the ideas that are just amazingly accurate now who is going to associate uranus with those two things it's not what we think of but i'm telling you that this is the benefit to getting to the core meaning of the planets you can do things like this now neptune neptune is considered to be spiritual spacey idealistic Neptune's not as spacey as its reputation is, and not quite as spiritual as its reputation is, although there's some truth to that. Neptune motivates us to reach for an idea, a vision, or something that feels magical or wonderful. Yes, there is this magical and wonderful 
element to Neptune. Just like Venus attracts us to beauty, Neptune attracts us to the dream, to the vision, to something so glorious, so wonderful that our, it's like a dream come true to achieve that. Now, for some people, it's not so spiritual. For many people, it's money because they imagine that if they have a lot of money, they can live like a prince or a princess. They can, they, their whole world would change. They're no longer slaves to their work, to their daily lives. They, everything would change. They would, they would end up in a fairy tale. So there is this feeling about Neptune of entering a fairy tale of something wondrous, something bigger than normal everyday life, something more transcendent. So yes, there is a spiritual element to Neptune, but it doesn't necessarily lead to spirituality in the way that we often think of it. Love of money is an, ex an example. What is it that people just would die for? Like they would feel like they just died and went to heaven. For some people, it's having front row seats at a football game to, or to meet a popular celebrity, to have those clothes that they saw in the store that are just so totally awesome. You just want to have them. You feel like you've entered into some magical world. So things that are mundane can be Neptunian. Here's the thing about Neptune. Neptune often sees the magic in everyday life, in things that other people don't see the magic in. A lot of people don't see magic in a big sporting event, but many people do, and that's actually Neptunian. So this is, again, a slightly different feeling about Neptune. And really, Neptune is, in a way, the most important planet because if we're not living for our dreams, we can become apathetic. What are we living for? Where's the magic? Where's the vision? Where's the excitement? If we don't have a dream, if we just think we're in a material world just to feed our bodies and then die and make ourselves happy and comfortable and it's just over, without some kind of dream, some magic, we lose inspiration. So Neptune gives inspiration, gives meaning to our lives. And Neptune can sometimes result in being easily deceived because we want that dream so much. So a lot of the things that are said about the planets are true. They typically happen. Vibrational astrology just gives us a way to focus in on the essential thing that I believe is always happening. It's always there. It's always true because that's what the planets actually do. Okay, last one, Pluto. Pluto makes any planet that it aspects compulsive and obsessive. It gives us this deeply rooted passion, a passion that goes beyond logic or reasoning. It's as if, it feels when Pluto aspects a planet, like if you have Mercury-Pluto aspect, or Venus-Pluto, or Mars-Pluto, that planet that it aspects, the Mercury, or the Venus, or Mars, any planet that Pluto aspects, it brings with it the power of an ocean wave. It feels like it's deeply rooted in past lives, like this big, deep ancestral wave of power or past life power just overcomes you and floods you. And Pluto is associated with past lives, and it feels like it. You know, maybe we don't know if there really are past lives, but Pluto gives this compulsive and obsessive and irrational force that you feel like you just can't resist it. That's what Pluto does. And some interesting things about the planet Pluto in terms of its astronomy. Pluto is out in what's called the Kuiper Belt. It's locked into a two to three orbital resonance with Neptune. So a lot of people, in, a lot of times in astrology, we don't talk about this, that Pluto's orbit is not independent of Neptune's orbit. And this is different from other orbits, like Jupiter being 12 times slower than the Earth. Those are approximations. Neptune and Pluto are in a strict orbital resonance. You can Google it and read about it. It's it's an astronomical fact. And also there are many objects moving at the same speed as Pluto. They're called Plutinos. They all orbit the sun at the same speed. And there's this mass of objects. It's like a it's like a herd of sheep going around and synchronized in this two to three resonance with the with the speed of Neptune, which is why we're living and what we're dreaming about. And Pluto brings this collective feeling. It's in the collective zone out in the Kuiper belt with dozens or possibly hundreds of other Plutinos. And it gives this collective mass, massive 
wave feeling that comes through you. So that's what Pluto does. And we see, again, that vibrational astrology is not that different, not extremely different from the usual ideas in astrology. It just focuses it in a little more specific about exactly what each planet is doing. We also use other objects in vibrational astrology, like Ceres, which is considered to be a minor planet by the astronomers. Um, I have a separate video on Ceres. I have a separate video on Chiron, where we did a controlled research studies without any uh, cherry-picked data to, to demonstrate what they use. So I'm focusing this video on the main 10 objects, the ones we use regularly, but we can use other objects in vibrational astrology. I also have a video on what other objects are probably important, and there's some kind of surprising information on that. But anyway, this video, I want to just stick to the 10 planets. So that's it. Uh, this is a long video. I'm at 40 minutes. I like to give the videos down to a half hour at most. This is a long one um, because I wanted to cover all 10 planets in one video. Conclusion, in VA, we use very simple meanings of the planets. The meanings are described as a process, a motivation, an interest, a force, a direction, a purpose in the person's lives. And the behaviors and personality traits that develop from this are formed by the aspects between the planets, especially also the sign and house affected, but mostly the aspects and things like midpoint structures, these planetary patterns, combine these functions together. And then you, when you combine them together, which I will describe what each pair of planets does in another video, you get very specific uh, consequences that are almost unavoidable as a result of those energy processes combining together. So that's it. it, it an interesting uh, new perspective, or relatively new, nothing's completely new, idea on what the planets do according to vibrational astrology. Okay, my friends, I hope you found that interesting. God bless. Namaste.